today comes from Luke, the 20th chapter, the first and the second and the eighth verse. And it reads, one day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us by what authority you're doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? Verse 8, Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. So we're going to talk today about Jesus' Passover teaching. We're going to continue our Lenten series, which is entitled The Seven Days That Changed the World, which is the overview of Jesus' last, the last week of Jesus' life. And so a couple of weeks ago, we started this series by charting the path of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on a donkey so that he could fulfill the prophecy. It was Sunday, and there was a parade, because it was a day of celebration as Jesus made his way into Jerusalem for the Passover, where he would be a sacrificial lamb. And last week, we talked about Jesus's weep, Jesus weeping over Jerusalem and cursing the fig tree and clearing the temple of the money changers. And so Monday was an emotional day as Jesus went about his work. And today we focus on Tuesday. It was the day of teaching. Jesus had spent Monday evening in Bethany, probably in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, since that's where he spent his Sunday evening. But he got up on early on Tuesday morning, he and the disciples, and they returned to Jerusalem. But what he didn't know um, is the night before, on Monday evening, three groups had come together, and they had begun to conspire against Jesus. The Herodians, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. And they had a common goal, and that was to get rid of Jesus, and at the very least, to discredit him in front of the people. They wanted to discredit him in front of all of those people who had followed him into Jerusalem. And in fact, Mark 11, the 11th chapter, the 18th through the 19th verse says, after Jesus had cleared the temple, the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and they began to start looking for a way to kill him because they feared him. And that was because the people were amazed by his teaching. So who were these people who wanted to get rid of Jesus? Well, first we had the Herodians and they were persons who were opposed to uh, Pontius Pilate who was uh, um, the current Roman procurer. And they wanted a restoration of one of Herod's sons to the throne. And the Sadducees were the conservatives. They were the aristocrats. They were the priestly class. And they didn't believe in the afterlife or the resurrection. And then finally you had the Pharisees who were the largest group in number and they were the liberals. And they believed in the afterlife. And they are, those three groups are really indicative of what was happening in the land. The Jews, the Jews were divided, not only from a theological perspective, but they were also divided from a political perspective. And so what they did is they had split into many different groups, and they had many different beliefs around the Roman government. You know, some of them believed in conciliation. Some of them said, we have to coexist together. There were some people who just lived in silence, and then there were others, like the Zealots, who uh, engaged in an outright armed rebellion. But they all held, had one thing in common. They hated and despised Pontius Pilate, and they wanted out from under Roman rule. And they were looking at Jesus, and they wanted to understand, and as you can imagine, when you have all of those groups, they wanted to understand where Jesus stood on the issues. And then they heard his teaching, and he talked about going the extra mile and turning the other cheek and praying for your enemies. They were looking for somebody to shake things up. Jesus did shake things up, but just not in the way that they wanted. They saw Jesus, a man who loved others and who healed others, but they also saw in Jesus someone who challenged the old ways. Isn't that what Jesus does in all of our lives? 
He challenges our old way of thinking, our old way of living, of doing, and being. His very presence in our lives brings transformation and he brings change to us. So this conference with the three groups was, again, ultimately designed to discredit Jesus. But they wanted to be careful about how they did that because they didn't want him to be a martyr. They much preferred that he look like a fool. So they agreed. The group came to an agreement that each of them would take an opportunity to ask him a question near and dear to their heart um, while he was teaching in the temple. And they weren't asking questions, as you can imagine, because they thought they could learn something from him. They just wanted to trick him. And they were hoping that Jesus would have a slip of the tongue or he would make a misstep that would allow them to then discredit him. And as I go through the scripture today, a lot of it is from Luke, uh, Luke 20, but a lot of it is also from Matthew, the 22nd chapter as well. So if you want to read later, um, it's those two particular passages in the gospel. And so, you know, when we look at, we look at those scriptures, you know, Jesus just fundamentally had a different approach to his teaching than those three groups. You know, for Jesus, life in this world was, is an opportunity to build something that's lasting and eternal. You know, each of us have an opportunity in this life to build something. We can build a, a great family, a good reputation, a great, a great career, a relationship with God. But to build those things, we have to focus on the right things. And the difference between, I said Jesus had just had a fundamentally different approach than these groups, and the difference was that these groups focused on the temporary things. They focused on things of this world where Jesus was focused on things that were eternal. And so Daniel Wester offers us this excellent advice. He says, if our work down here is done on marble, it'll perish. If our work is done on brass, time will erode it. If we build temples, eventually they're going to crumble to dust. But if we work on men's minds and hearts, if we fill them with high principles and with fear and reverence of God and love of their fellow men, then we engrave on their hearts something that time cannot destroy. We build something that lasts for all eternity. So Jesus was all about building and teaching. And that's what we need today. We need good teachers who are committed not to their current positions, but who are committed to the word of God. William Ward says, a mediocre teacher will tell us what to do. A good teacher, a good teacher will explain what we need to do. A superior teacher will demonstrate what we need to do. But a great teacher will inspire us to do it. And Jesus was a great teacher. And as we learn more about him during this Lenten season, we should be inspired by his work and his teachings. So we see on Tuesday morning in our scripture that Jesus is teaching in the temple. And while he's teaching, he's confronted by these three, three groups, one by one. And because time is of the essence, and Jesus does, only has a few more days left, he responds to their questions decisively and unapologetically. And he does it because he cares for the people as a whole, and he is especially annoyed and displeased with those, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, who claim to lead the people, but in fact have taken an approach that benefits their own beliefs in the place of the Word of God and the ways of God. And so when you read the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are a number of different questions that are listed there. They're very good. We're going to focus on the questions that are listed in Luke. And so the Herodians ask the first question. And Jesus makes our first point, which is, we live in this world, but we're not of this world. So the first question asked by the Herodians really dealt with the relationship between church and state. And they asked the question because, again, they hoped to catch Jesus in something that he said so that they could hand him over to the power and authority of the governor, which is what they ultimately did, right? It's what they ultimately did. And so in Luke, the 20th chapter, the 21st and the 21st, 22nd verse, it says, so the spies questioned him. 
And they said, teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And the question is, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And clearly this is a, um, a trick question for Jesus because if he says no, then the Romans are gonna arrest him for treason. And if he says yes, he's gonna enrage the masses because they hated the Romans and the tax that they had to pay. And so Jesus took a coin, coin and asked whose picture was stepped on that, stamped on that coin. <laughs> you know, what he's really saying to them is there's two sides to every coin. Things aren't always as black and white as we would like them to be. And so he says to them, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Again, it's the age-old question of God and government. And the real question is, where do you draw the line, right? That's what they're asking. Where do you draw the line? And Jesus is saying that a yes or a no to their question is really too simplistic. And they're saying to Jesus, but you have to choose a side. And so that's why Jesus shows them both sides of the coin. The coin related directly to the pagan Roman religion. So when you looked at one side, it had Caesar's image and it had the words Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And on the other side, it had the high priest of Roman religion. And whether they liked it or not, that was the coin that they had to use. So Jesus is saying that one side of the coin is that we live in this world, and the other side of the coin is that we're not of this world. He's saying that the government does have a legitimate claim upon their lives, but God also has a claim on their lives. So we have a duty to our nation, however we interpret that duty for ourselves. But we also belong to God. And so that's a fine line for us sometimes. And sometimes we have to struggle with that fine line. Devotion to God demands a higher allegiance to him than anything else in our lives. But what Jesus is saying is, it's not an excuse for us to avoid our other responsibilities that don't conflict with our duty to God. So he says, we have to live responsibly with both loyalties in mind. And so he says, render to Caesar what's Caesar. And what he means is, give Caesar back what is his, which is the coin. And this is what the scripture says about our um, obligation to our government. Romans the 13th chapter, six through, the, six through the seventh verse, it says, this is, why, this is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants. We may not like that, right? We may not like that depending on who, who's, in, who's in charge. But the scripture says, the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to govern. Give to everyone what you owe. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If you owe respect, then provide respect. If they're due honor, then provide honor. At 1 Peter, the second chapter, the 13th through the 14th verse says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor or to the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend, commend those who do right. So that's what it means to render to Caesar what's due to him. To render to God what's his is to render worship to him alone. That means all that we own, all that we are, and all that we do. So let me give you an example of what that means. So if you're driving down the street and you see on our sign out front, on our sign it says, pray for our truth. Yes, we all can agree, right? On that statement, for a number of reasons because a number of us have family who are in the military or who were in the military, or there are those of us who have been in the military ourselves. 
And we all know that the life that we live here is because they protect us every day. So when we see that on our sign, we say, yes, that's right. But we see it through the eyes of an American citizen. That's who we are, right? But Jesus also taught us, if we think about this in times of war, he also taught us to pray for our enemies as well. So as Christians, we have a duty to do both. And that's hard to deal with at times, right? Because I just said we have family members who are currently in the armed forces or who were in the armed forces. But as Christians, we're called to a higher plane. And that means that we have a higher duty. And so sometimes we have to wrestle with that. So maybe, also on our side now front, there should be a phrase that says, pray for peace. Because that's the ultimate call, right? That's where we want to be, where we're not having to choose between one or the other. That's probably as appropriate as pray for our troops. We're God's children first. So the cross comes before anything else in our lives. That's the hard part, right? I think we're all sitting here thinking, yeah, that's the hard part. We're citizens of heaven first. Isn't that what we tell, tell ourselves? Because that's where we want to end up. We're citizens of heaven first. That means we are not of this world. So living here in the United States is a privilege, but this is our temporary home. So we must and should pray for our troops, but we also pray for peace around the world. Does that make, that make sense when we said, render to Caesar what do to Caesar and give to God what's God? <laughs> So if we're going to err, we're going to err in favor of God. And it is a delicate balancing act. And Jesus understood that it was de uh, delicate. You could hear it in the careful answer that he gave to them. And he's saying at times we have a duty to Rome. But we also, at the same time, have a duty to God. And if we're serving God, we have to ensure that those things don't conflict in our lives. For example... If you go tomorrow, tomorrow and tell the IRS that you gave all your money to the church because you just felt this need to help the church, well, God asked for a 10% tithe, and he asked for an offering. And he says in Malachi, the sixth chapter, the ninth verse, that we should bring our tithes to the storehouse so there should be meat in, Rama, in, in his house. And if we do that, there's more than enough. But if we make the argument to the IRS that we gave everything to the church, pretty soon we won't be able to help the church, right? Right? We won't be able to help the church. So he's saying there's a delicate balance in how we do this. And in, in any way, Jesus straddles that issue so that the Herodians aren't able to, to entrap him. And, and rather than compromising his uh, popular support, what Jesus does is he shows that he has not just knowledge, but he also has wisdom. And he applies that wisdom in the context to the life that we're living in this world while at the same time serving an eternal God. And we can do both. And so the second question comes from the Sadducees. And Jesus answered, and basically what he says is there's no marriage in, resurre in the resurrection. You know, these are, the, these are the people, as you recall, that don't believe in the resurrection. And so their question dealt with the afterlife. And then they asked Jesus this hypothetical question about a woman who married uh, uh, into a family who had seven sons. And she married the first son, and he passed away. And according to the law, she married the second son, and he passed away. And then she married the third son, and he passed away, and, and all down the line until ultimately she had married all seven sons, and they'd all passed away. And so they asked Jesus the question, they're like, well, in heaven, whose husband will she be? 
And the reason they asked that question because it pointed out kind of the absurdity of the idea or the thought of an afterlife. But the question was absurd to Jesus for another reason. And he answered it by saying, he says, in the resurrection, people will neither marry nor will they be given in marriage. Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> in other words, what he's saying is that heaven is on another dimension. It won't be, our lives in heaven won't be like our lives are here. Uh, Revelations, the 21st chapter, the third through the fourth verse says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the order of the old things have passed away. And so that scripture tells us, that heaven is on a, on a different dimension from where we are today. The Sadducees had said in Acts 23rd chapter, the 8th verse, the Sadducees says there's no resurrection. Neither are there angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believed that there was. So Jesus says to them, he says, there's no marriage. That law had a purpose down here, has a purpose down here on earth, and it was to protect the widow and to guarantee that the, the guarantee the continuance of the family bloodline. That's why she married each of the brothers. What Jesus is saying to them is that you're really basing your question on this faulty premise, and his answer is very direct. But then he goes on to deal with the real issue. He said, God is the God of the living and not of the dead. And so what did he mean? What did he mean when he said that? He's really saying to the Sadducees is that you're concerning yourself with the afterlife. And the problem is you really haven't learned how to live life down here. He says, heaven is not really our responsibility. Heaven is God's responsibility. And our responsibility is to live our life here and now. And if we do that in a manner that's pleasing to God, it'll all work out in the end. We don't have to worry about it. Our, our afterlife, our eternal life is secure. And he's saying there'll be a new eternal order. We won't follow the earthly order. In heaven, there's no marriage. There's no pre procreation. There's no death. And Mark says that in the 12th chapter, the 25th verse. And most Jewish people agree that angels didn't eat or drink or reproduce and Angels didn't die unless God destroyed them. And so there's no real need to reproduce. And so Jesus is saying that his statement about lack of marriage and procreation largely follows the logic of an afterlife and, re and, and resurrection. And he's saying that our life will be about fellowship and service to God, not about all that stuff that we did or that we're doing down here. And the scripture says that the Sadducees were at loss for words and they quietly returned to their seats because Jesus had exposed their lack of scriptural knowledge. In fact, he says in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, the 31st verse, he says, but about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read, is what he says to them, what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. And what Jesus is saying is that God wouldn't claim to be the God of someone who no longer exist, existed. What's the point? He has this covenant with his people, and he's faithful, and is associated with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if he keeps his word to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then he will keep his word to us. And if his power is unlimited, as he says, he'll ultimately fulfill his promise to all of his descendants and all of us to be our father eternally. And so the crowds, it says, were astounded by Jesus' quick wit. And he says, focus, what he's saying to them is focus on the living, not on the dead. There's no marriage in heaven. Why would we want to take the same disagreements and challenges of relationships like marriages into heaven? If the scripture says there's no more suffering and no more pain, doesn't that by default mean there's no more marriage in heaven? You know, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, I'm kidding. Okay, so the third question, the third question is from the Pharisees. It's, and the answer to it is God first and then everything else. And so I said that the Pharisees are the largest group represented 
And they're the guardians of the Torah, so their question dealt with the law and man's relationship to the law. And so they said, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. So they thought, we have to pull our thing ourselves together if we're going to succeed in testing him. And one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. He said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And so they knew if Jesus emphasized one particular law, that could be viewed by his critics as de-emphasizing other aspects of the law. But Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. All the prophets, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Mm -hmm. So he covered both of those. He referenced Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, the fifth verse, that says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. And he's really saying to them, if you can do that, if you can love God in that way, and love your neighbor as yourself, you can do away with all of those 600 laws that you have about how people can be obedient. You can throw all of that stuff away if you can just follow those two laws. And that's still true today. A new commandment I have for you. Love each other as I have loved you. We could throw away the rest of the book if we did that. And so Jesus is saying we have to have true love for our neighbors. And we have to demonstrate that beyond our own circle of favored friends. We all have favored friends. He's saying, let's reach beyond our circle of friends. And sometimes that's tough for us. Relationships are work. They take time. Matthew, the fifth chapter, the 43rd through the 47th verse says, you've heard, it said, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. It says, but I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, that you may, you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? That's not, what we're saying is that's not hard. If we love people who love us, that's not the hard uh, part. But he says, what reward will we get? Aren't the tax collectors doing that? That's easy. Even those of us who aren't saved can do that. He's calling us to a higher plane. He's saying, don't do just what's easy, or don't just do what's expected of us. He's saying, do more. And so he summons us to love others. And what he assumes is that all of us including Christians, need the love of other people. Think about it. If we are called to give love to others, that means that someone is called to give love to us. So we're never going to be short of God's love. And what we really have to do is learn to love and affirm one another better, particularly those who are wounded and vulnerable among us, who, you know, no matter how hard they try, can't see the love of God in themselves. So he calls us to love ourselves, but more importantly, to love those people who are broken, who desperately try to affirm the, the love of God in themselves, but can't. And so he calls us to do that on their behalf. And as I close, one of the things that Jesus has done now that he's had this conversation with these three groups, he says, now it's my turn. And he says, I want to ask you a question. And his question is, what do you think of Christ? Matthew, the 22nd chapter, the 42nd verse. The question he asked the group is, what do you think of Christ? And isn't that the question that Jesus still asks us today? It is the most relevant, the most urgent, the most theological, the most important issue that confronts us today. Wherever we are, whatever, wherever we are in life, and whatever we're faced with, in this life, we're faced with the implications of the question, what do we think of Jesus? 
The questions that the Herodians and the Pharisees and the Sadducees asked Jesus was about man's relationship with God. But Jesus' question was about man's relationship with God. I think I said that right. Sadducees, the question that the Herodians, Sadducees, and Pharisees um, asked of Jesus was about man's relationship with man. And Jesus' question dealt with man's relationship with God. So they were putting the cart before the horse. Today, the crowds are still asking the wrong questions and trying to find out the right answers. So when we talk about things like pollution, war, race relations, world hunger, all we're really doing is skirting around the $10 million question of what do you think of Christ? Because that's the answer to all of the questions. If we find Jesus to be the answer, that's what drives our behavior and our solutions. The story was told of a preacher who was attempting to, he was putting his finishing touches on his Sunday sermon and he was constantly being interrupted by his six-year-old daughter. So he took a picture of a globe and he cut it up into little pieces and he gave it to her and he told her to put it back together and he knew it would keep her busy for a long time. But to his surprise, within a few minutes, she'd come back and she completed the picture. And he asked her, he said, well, how did you do that so fast? And she said, simple. There's a picture of Jesus on the back of it. So I simply put his face together and the rest of the world fell in line. Amen. Yeah, isn't that what Jesus is saying to us today? If we can just put together the picture of Jesus, everything else will find fall in line. What do we think of Christ? That's the real lesson of Jesus' teaching, isn't it? Amen. Amen. And if there's anyone